Nucleophilic acyl substitution going to be the topic in this lesson, and easily this is the most important lesson in this chapter. So just like ketones and aldehydes, the major class of reactions they did was nucleophilic addition. Well, for carboxylic acids and derivatives, it's nucleophilic acyl substitution. And there's a big pattern you're going to want to catch, and once you see that pattern, it's going to make predicting products much easier throughout this chapter. Now in the next lesson, we're gonna go through the mechanisms, and it turns out there's three different possible mechanisms depending upon conditions and stuff. So, but in this one, we're just gonna recognize this pattern of reactivity and how to predict whether reactions are favorable or not and how to predict products. Now this lesson's part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing them weekly throughout the school year. So if you wanna be notified every time I post a new lesson, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so nucleophilic acyl substitution. So uh, with ketones and aldehydes, we saw a nucleophilic addition and, and the nucleophile was gonna come and attack the carbonyl carbon. So pushing the electrons up to the oxygen and then that oxygen was gonna get protonated, we get an alcohol. Well, in this case, something else is gonna happen. And the key is, is that ketones and aldehydes don't actually have a leaving group, but the carboxylic acids and carboxylic acid derivatives are all gonna have something that it may be a poor leaving group, but at the very least, it's gonna actually be able to function as a leaving group. Whereas for ketones and aldehydes, so carbon and hydrogen are never gonna function as leaving groups in any kind of reliable sense. So. Uh, in this case, though, so we're going to see a whole slew of different possible leaving groups. Some will be good, some will be poor, some will be intermediate. So, But all we're going to be doing is replacing that leaving group with some new nucleophile. And that nucleophile is going to come and attack your carbonyl carbon. So it turns out the electrons will get pushed up, the pi electrons up to the oxygen, but they'll come right back down, it turns out, and then kick off that leaving group. And the net result, though, is all we want to really focus on here. The mechanism is going to be in the next lesson. But the net result is that now this new nucleophile has replaced the leaving group, and now the leaving group has been displaced. That's a substitution reaction, and it's nucleophilic acyl substitution. So it's uh, substitution by a nucleophile at the acyl carbon. That carboxyl carbon in a carboxylic acid or derivative is called an acyl carbon. Cool. Now there's a big, some big trends in reactivity we need to understand. So it turns out that not any old nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction is going to be spontaneous. So what has to happen is you have to get more stable as you go from reactant to product. And how we predict that, there's a couple different trends you might use and they both are going to lead you to the same conclusion. So it turns out that the acid halides are the most reactive uh, of our carboxylic acid derivatives, then anhydrides, then esters and carboxylic acids are roughly equal in reactivity, So, and then finally amides. And like I said, we can actually explain this in one of a couple of different ways. So one, we can just look at how good is the leaving group, because we know how to rank leaving groups, and the better the leaving group, the more reactive that particular carboxylic acid or acid derivative. And so in this case, we've got the best leaving groups we could possibly have here, in bromide and chloride. And back when we studied you know, SN1 and SN2 and E1 and E2, we learned that these were the classic, you know, a couple examples of the classic good leaving groups. Now, if we move over to anhydride, now technically anhydride's got two acyl carbons. And in this case, I picked a symmetrical anhydride, so it doesn't really matter which one we're talking about here. So I'm gonna choose, this is the one we're attaching the new nucleophile to, which means that all of this would be the leaving group. Now recall the hallmark of a good leaving group is that it's really stable after it leaves. And we can tell if it's really stable based on how good of a base it is. If it's a really weak base, it's gonna be really stable after it leaves in a good leaving group. So just like chloride and bromide being the conjugate bases of the strong acids HCl and HBr, we know they're really, really weak conjugate bases and good leaving groups. Same thing here. So here the leaving group after it leaves is going to be a carboxylate. So and in this case, that negative charge on the oxygen here is gonna be resonance stabilized between two oxygens. So, and it's a legitimate weak base, that carboxylate, like you would have studied in Gen Chem. Whereas these, we might've been calling them so weak that we call them negligible bases back in Gen Chem. This one's going to be a little bit stronger base. It's still a weak base, so definitely stronger though than chloride and bromide, so not nearly as good a leaving group. And so anhydrides are not going to be quite as reactive as the acid halides. Then we move on to esters and carboxylic acids, and here we're going to have an alkoxide leaving group or a hydroxide leaving group. So, and we just got a big decrease in reactivity. We went from really good leaving groups 
to decent leaving group to these are going to be poor leaving groups. Notice hydroxide, if this leaves hydroxide, well, hydroxide's a strong base. And an alkoxide is roughly equal in strength as a base as well. And so when hydroxides and alkoxides are your leaving groups, they're not going to be the most stable things after they leave. They're strong bases. And so all of a sudden, not nearly as reactive. And so again, high reactivity in the, in the acid halide, fairly high in the anhydride, big drop in reactivity. In fact, if we had to put uh, aldehydes and ketones on the map here somewhere, uh, and how quickly they'd react with a nucleophile, they'd be right in between the anhydride and the ester. And so we've got anhydrides are more reactive, I'm sorry, acid halides are more reactive than anhydrides, but big drop in reactivity as we go to esters and carboxylic acids. And once again, it's going to drop even further as we go to amides here. And so once again, if we take a look at this leaving group here, so here would be an amide leaving group. And we learned like, you know, things like sodium amide, super strong base, like ridiculously strong base. So in this thing, horrible leaving group. Now, it's a horrible leaving group that, I, and it's still something I might tempt, you know, be tempted to call a leaving group, but it's a pretty terrible leaving group. And so lowest in reactivity. And so we've kind of determined this trend in reactivity and you're supposed to memorize this trend. And we've you know, determine this trend based on how good the leaving group is. Now, there's another way to look at this, though. So, and we're talking about how reactive these are as electrophiles. How reactive would they be when they react with a nucleophile? And it's all about how much partial positive charge that carbon is. That, car that acyl carbon, the more partially positive it is, the more attractive it's going to be found by a nucleophile. Well, bromide and chloride are electron withdrawing. They're pulling electrons away from that carbon, making it more partially positive and therefore more reactive as an electrophile. Now, if we move our way on over here, so in this case, you guys learned that oxygens and nitrogens with lone pairs, which is, includes all of these, were actually electron donating groups, not withdrawing groups. And so they're actually going to decrease the amount of partial positive charge on every single one of these carbons. And so whereas here, the chloride and the bromide increase the amount of partial positive charge and increase the reactivity. So here they're going to decrease the reactivity all the way across. So but in a progressive way. So if we kind of just look at oxygen versus nitrogen first, let's talk about those. We learned that nitrogen being a less electronegative was a stronger donating group. And so it's going to decrease the amount of partial positive on that carbon the most out of any of these, making the amides the least reactive. Now between these two though, so it's oxygen versus oxygen versus oxygen. Well, we know these are about equivalent. So what's going on here? Well, this oxygen right here, it might donate electron density towards this carbonyl, the one that we're you know, looking at, or it might go the opposite direction. So towards the other one as well. And so it can donate towards either side. And as a result, it's not going to donate as a much electron density towards either side, half as much, in fact. And that's why these carbons are going to have a little bit more partial positive charge than say these ones right here, even though it's oxygen in both cases. So that's kind of the deal. And so we can explain again, our trends and reactivity based on how good the leaving group is or based on how partially positive. So those acyl carbons are in each successive case. At the end of the day though, you need to understand that acid halides are the most reactive. So then acid and hydrides, then esters and carboxylic acids roughly equal, and then amides. That's our order of reactivity. So let's kind of take a look and see how it is these are involved in these specific nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions. All right, so I've kind of put all the carboxylic acids and, and derivatives on the board in a certain order here. And uh, highest on the list is the most reactive and they get less reactive as you go down. And so again, acid halides are the most reactive, then anhydrides, then esters and carboxylic acids are roughly equal in reactivity, then amides. And then I'm gonna put carboxylate on here, which we haven't seen yet. So, but if you look at that carboxylate, now with a negative charge on the oxygen, it's even more electron donating and even less partial positive charge on that carbon would be one way to look at it. Or if this thing tried to up and leave, it would actually be the oxide ion with a negative two charge and an even worse leaving group than anything else we've looked at. So definitely less reactive than anything we've looked at. And so reactive, it's kind of like the bottom of the food chain here, if you will, in reactivity and you can't really convert it into any of these others, as we'll see, uh, with one exception. All right, so the way this works, since you got most reactive at the top and less reactive as you go down, generally the thermodynamics and the kinetics are favorable if you're going downhill in energy, but not uphill in energy. So it turns out we can turn an acid halide into an anhydride directly, but we can't turn an anhydride into an acid halide directly. And so generally you can convert any 
you know, carboxylic acid derivative or carboxylic acid into any of the others, the question is just really, can you do it in one step or in many steps? So you can only do it in one step if you're going downhill. And so we can turn the acid halide into any of them. I can turn it into the acid anhydride, the ester, the amide, or the carboxylate. So because it's downhill energetically in every single case. And so it's gonna have a lower activation energy and it's gonna have a negative delta G when we actually go that direction. So, but again, if we try to go the other direction, if I try to turn an ester into an acid halide, again, that would have a rather high activation energy and it would have a positive delta G. And so not a favorable reaction at all, not something we'd try to do. So how does this work? How do we convert these? Well, the big thing is just realizing who your leaving group is and then what you're trying to replace that leaving group with, depending on what you're converting it to. That's kind of the deal here. So if we take a look at the acid halide here, so we're gonna take a look at converting it into the acid anhydride, turning it into the ester, turning it into the amide, turning it into the carboxylate, and we'll see that we'll take a look at turning it into the carboxylic acid as well. All right, so this is kind of what we're gonna take a look at here. And so the big thing is just, what do you wanna replace that chlorine with? Well, in this case, I wanna replace it with this carboxylate, the carboxylate. And typically you'll find that, you know, you've got a couple different options. So a lot of these reactions are gonna turn out are either gonna be acid catalyzed or base catalyzed. Although you'll find out with an acid halide or an acid anhydride, you don't actually need a catalyst at all. And so let's take a look here. We wanna replace it here with this group right here. That's what I want to place the chlorine in the acid halide with in order to get this acid anhydride. Now, if I put a negative charge on this thing, that would actually be a strong nucleophile, stronger than if I protonate it and let it have no charge instead. And so we got a couple different options here. So if I protonate it and make it a neutral species and just use a carboxylic acid, that's actually what we would consider the uncatalyzed reaction. Whereas if we use the corresponding conjugate base, the anion, that's what we'd consider base catalyzed. And then the other option is to go back and still use the neutral species, but use it in the presence of an acid, and we'd call that acid catalyzed. And so there's not always just one set of reagents that might work. And in some cases, there might be three sets of reagents that would all work for the conversion. But I just wanna make sure you realize the difference here. So when it's uncatalyzed, you're using the neutral reagent. Look at what the leaving group is that you wanna stick on there with what the new nucleophile, I guess, is one way to look at it. That's replacing the leaving group and just put an extra H on it. That's the uncatalyzed reagent. Now here's the deal. Most of the reactions we're gonna study are gonna to need to be either acid or base catalyzed. So the only ones that can actually use just the plain old neutral nucleophile all by itself, no catalyst, are the acid halides and the acid anhydrides. They don't require the use of a catalyst, but everything less reactive, including esters, carboxylic acids, amides, they're going to require the use of either acid or base catalysis. So that's the deal. So for these two though, we really do have three options. So we wanna kinda of diagram those out a little bit. So in this case, turn the acid halide into the anhydride. I could just use the neutral nucleophile and that would be totally fine. I could also use the corresponding anion and that would be base catalyzed and that would be fine. But I could also use the neutral nucleophile with an acid catalyst and that would be acid catalyzed and that would be fine. On this chart, what you're gonna find is I'm gonna use blue for the base catalyzed reagent, red for the acid catalyzed reagent, and then black for just the uncatalyzed reagent. But any one of these sets of reagents would turn the acid chloride into the anhydride. You definitely find the top two are more common. So oftentimes we don't even consider acid catalysis for the acid halides, it's just completely unnecessary. These are so reactive as it is. So, but I put it there because in principle it could work out that way. Cool, so that's how you make the acid anhydride. It works the same way if you wanna make the ester, but instead of the ester, now you look and say, well, I wanna replace the chloride leaving group or the bromide leaving group with an alkoxide. Well, again, the neutral species 
would be an alcohol. Just protonate the leaving or the new nucleophile, I should say, and make it an alcohol. So that would be the neutral species. So the conjugate base here, anion, that would be base catalyzed, or the neutral species yet again, again, which is the alcohol. with an acid would be the acid catalyzed mechanism. And I forgot to get a little prime here for my R prime. All right, so those are our three possibilities, uncatalyzed, base catalyzed, acid catalyzed. So, and any of those could be used for the acid chloride con being converted into an ester. Okay, so what if I wanna convert the acid chloride into the amide? Well, now I've got this NR2 group that I wanna replace the chlorine or bromine with. So. And in such case, once again, the neutral species, NR2 with an H added on, that would be the uncatalyzed reagent. But I could also do this base catalyzed and use the corresponding conjugate base or anion. Or once again, we could potentially do this acid catalyzed So, and use the neutral species plus some acid to pull this off as well. Okay, so now we've got to talk about your carboxylic acid and the corresponding carboxylate and their relationship. If you notice, the carboxylic acid is just the conjugate acid of the carboxylate, the conjugate base. These are just an acid base pair, and you can convert them back and forth with each other. So, if you just add acid or base, you can go back and forth here. So, if we add acid here, to the carboxylate, it'll protonate it, turn into the carboxylic acid. If you add base, so to the carboxylic acid, you'll deprotonate it and get the carboxylate. So those are interconvertible. This is one place where, you know, going uphill or downhill totally just depends on how acidic or basic your solution is. And don't worry about, oh, Chad told me I can't go uphill. Well, here, you totally can go uphill, right here. There's a couple key places where you can. All right, so no problem there. Well, it turns out if we take a look at going to a carboxylic acid now, so in this case, I want to replace my chlorine or bromine with an OH. Okay, well, let's start with the base catalyzed reagent here. So with an OH would look like so, that would be the base catalyzed reagent. And we're gonna find out we have a problem if we use that. So however, if we look at the neutral species, just what, what happens when you add another H plus to OH? Well, you get water. And so the reagent without a catalyst is water. In fact, I'm going to put that up here because it's on its way to the carboxylic acid. Now, if we want to do this acid catalyzed, we'd add water with H plus, which is H3O plus. And that would be the acid catalyzed reagent. But we're going to find a problem with using hydroxide because if we use hydroxide and do the base catalyzed reaction, well, hydroxide and your carboxylic acid product would react and your carboxylic acid would get deprotonated and turn into the carboxylate anyways. And so it turns out if you just add hydroxide and try to do this base catalyzed, you're not gonna get your carboxylic acid. It turns out it'll go straight to the carboxylate. And so we're gonna change this up a little bit and draw this over on the other side of the arrow here. And it turns out so that it doesn't actually, this is not just specific to the acid halide, but it turns out for any carboxylic acid derivative, we call them carboxylic acid derivatives because they're derived from carboxylic acids, but also they can all be converted into a carboxylic acid or into the corresponding carboxylate. If you add H3O+, every single one of these turns into a carboxylic acid, all of them. If you add concentrated hydroxide, every single one of these is gonna turn into a carboxylate. And I say concentrated because a couple of them are really one in particular, uh, actually probably a couple are really gonna need it to be concentrated. So, but as far as the acid halide is concerned, he's not gonna care. Put a little hydroxide in there, good. He'll form a carboxylate. All right, cool, so that's the way this works. So for the acid halide here, you can add water, uncatalyzed, and get a carboxylic acid. You can add H3O plus, acid catalyzed, get a carboxylic acid, or you can add hydroxide, base catalyzed, and get the carboxylate. Cool, and that's all the reactions for the acid chloride, and we just put the reagents on there. What's nice now is we can apply all of this to our acid and hydride. Now, I don't have a chloride or bromide leaving group anymore. I now have a carboxylate leaving group, but I want to replace it with exactly the same things, and it's gonna require exactly the same reagents. And so for the acid and hydride, I can't turn it into an acid halide. It turns out I can't do that. However, I can add an alcohol and get an ester, or add the alkoxide, the conjugate base, and get the ester base catalyzed, or add an alcohol with acid 
acid catalyzed and get the ester. Same exact reagents. Same thing going down the chain here. I can add an amine and get the amide. I can add the corresponding amide anion and get an amide base catalyzed. Or I can add the amine with acid, acid catalyzed, and get the amide as well. Cool. And then same thing all the way down. So if I add water uncatalyzed, I get a carboxylic acid. If I had H3O plus acid catalyzed, I get the carboxylic acid. And if I add hydroxide, I get the carboxylate. And so the, it's a little less reactive, but again, both of these are good to go. Don't actually need a catalyst. And so you can do uncatalyzed, acid catalyzed, or base catalyzed for either one of these in all of the reactions that are lower than them on this chart here. Cool, so then we move on to ester here. And ester is where we first encounter a problem. So if you recall, in going from the anhydride to the ester and the carboxylic acid, big decrease in reactivity. And so the uncatalyzed reactions no longer work. So also you can only go in downhill, not uphill. So you can't turn the ester into the anhydride and you can't turn the ester into the acid halide, but you can go downhill. You can turn an ester into an amide. Now, one thing you have to note though, is that the uncatalyzed reaction is not possible. It's gonna have to be either base catalyzed or acid catalyzed. Cool. Also, you can go downhill further and you can turn the ester either into a carboxylic acid or into the carboxylate. Now you can't just add water though. You can't use the uncatalyzed reagent. You can do acid catalyzed though, H3O plus, and get the carboxylic acid, or you can add hydroxide and get the carboxylate. And then finally the amide here. So the amide here, you can't go uphill. You can't convert it into an ester. You can't convert it into an hydride. You can't convert it into an acid halide, at least not directly. So, but you can go downhill, sort of. So these things are super unreactive. That leaving group is terrible. So, but whatever you do, whether it be base catalyzed or acid catalyzed, so H3O plus or OH minus, those are your options. You're gonna have to include heat. So you're gonna have to include a fair amount of heat to get these to work. Now, if you notice, going to the carboxylate under base catalyzed conditions, that'd be hydroxide and heat. So that's legit downhill. So, and the conditions don't have to be as harsh for that. But if you wanna turn the amide into a carboxylic acid, that's actually uphill. And this is an example of one of the reactions we can get to go uphill. Now it turns out though, so the energetics here are not super favorable. It actually has a slightly positive delta G and stuff, but you can get it to work if with H3O plus you add a fair amount of heat. So you gotta heat this up pretty hot to turn that amide into a carboxylic acid. Okay, so that takes us all the way through every reaction we go downhill. We saw two reactions that go uphill so far. We saw that you can just simply protonate your carboxylate with acid to get the carboxylic acid or the amide technically turning into a carboxylic acid with H3O plus and heat is technically an uphill reaction. Now we've got one other major uphill reaction and that turns out you can take your carboxylic acid and turn it into one of your acid halides. So, and it turns out the reagents are similar to what we saw for turning the OH of an alcohol into uh, 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 alkyl chloride or an alkyl bromide. We use SOCl2 and PBr3 back in the day, and we use exactly the same reagents, but instead of getting an alkyl chloride or an alkyl bromide, we're gonna get acyl chlorides and acyl bromides. Cool, you want the acid chloride, use SOCl2. You want the acid bromide, use PBr3. And so that's another step we can take to go uphill. And finally, we got one last thing to talk about here. And it turns out the ester and the carboxylic acid are roughly equal in reactivity and they can be interconverted back and forth as well. Now, both of these still require a catalyst, so, but we can pull this off. So let's talk about converting the ester into the carboxylic acid first. So in this case, I want to replace the OR with the OH. So the neutral species would be water, but you can't just use plain old water. You need a catalyst. And so the acid catalyst would be water with acid H3O plus. Well, that was kind of already implied by what we showed right here. So we kind of already knew that was going to happen. So nothing new actually by what we've written in here. We already knew we could turn the ester into the carboxylic acid H3O plus. So if you try to do this base catalyzed hydroxide, the conjugate base anion here, well, we already kind of know that the ester 
with hydroxide forms the carboxylate. So it actually won't take you here. It'll take you here and then keep going down to the carboxylate. So that's not really new either. So nothing new really shown here. So, and I don't really want to include the hydroxide there because the hydroxide really, I want to make sure you end up at that carboxylate, not at the carboxylic acid if you start with that ester. So, but we can write the H3O plus there. Okay. So, but go in the other direction. So the carboxylic acid back to the ester here. So, well, in this case, I want to replace the OH of my carboxylic acid with an OR. The neutral species would be the corresponding alcohol. So protonate that guy, ROH, and then you'd need an acid catalyst. Now, if we try to do this with the conjugate base, we find out we run into a problem. So I'm going to write this down first and then say, oh, let's just add the corresponding anion. Well, problem is this. If I add the corresponding anion, those are really strong bases. And before they ever get a chance to attack as a nucleophile right here, they'll just deprotonate the H on the carboxylic acid and get you a carboxylate. And once it's converted into a carboxylate, you're not going to get it to go to an ester. And so it turns out when you start with this carboxylic acid, the base catalyzed reactions aren't very favorable. You're not going to get them to work very well at all. And so we'll avoid them. It turns out if you actually did this in the lab, there's a couple exceptions, but you're not going to see them in this class. And so in this case, if you start from the carboxylic acid, you can turn it into the ester, but you got to do it acid catalyzed. You can turn it into the amide, but you got to do it acid catalyzed. And then obviously you can turn it into carboxylate just by simply deprotonating it under basic conditions. Those are your options. So just want to make sure you realize that you couldn't actually add like the alkoxide to the carboxylic acid and hope to come out with the ester. Adding the alkoxide would just deprotonate it and get you the carboxylate. Cool. So this is kind of the whole system of reactions and you now have enough information to convert any carboxylic acid derivative into any other carboxylic acid derivative. And here I've left it generic. Let's work out a few specific examples and see how this plays out. All right, so first one here, we've got an acid chloride wanting to be converted into an ester. And if I look on the list here, yep, acid chloride down to an ester. Yeah, we're going downhill in reactivity. This is possible. And since I'm starting with an acid halide, all three options are available, uncatalyzed, acid catalyzed, base catalyzed. And so in this case, I just want to focus in again on what we're trying to replace our leading group with, trying to place the chlorine here with this isopropoxide group, an alkoxide group. And so one possible reagent here would just be the corresponding protonated neutral species, isopropyl alcohol. That would be the uncatalyzed reaction. You could also just simply do that with also an acid, and that would be the acid catalyzed reagent and way less likely to actually see this, but there's nothing in principle wrong with it. And then finally, you could do the base catalyzed. And I often like to call this conjugate base catalyzed because it's the anion species, the conjugate base of your neutral species that you have to use, the exact thing you want to replace the leaving group with. A lot of students will see that, oh, acid catalyzed, just add the neutral species with acid. So base catalyzed must just mean add the neutral species with base. No. So the base you specifically have to use has to be the conjugate base, the thing that you directly want to replace the leaving group with. If you just put alcohol with base, that's not sufficient. We want to specifically use the conjugate base. So often Oftentimes I refer to base catalyzed in this context as conjugate base catalyzed, just to kind of remind us here. So, but cool, any one of these three would totally work and we could do it one step because we're going downhill. All right, for this next one, we're gonna start off with an amide, but I still wanna make the exact same ester. Now we have a problem. The amide is actually lower in reactivity than the ester and there's not a good way to go uphill, at least not in a single step. So however, any one of these can be converted into any of the others. If you're going downhill, you can typically do it in one step. But if you're going uphill, it's typically going to require many steps. And so the approach here is we're going to take this amide and we're going to have to convert it into a carboxylic acid. We'll take that carboxylic acid and convert it into an acid halide. And then once I've got the acid halide, I can turn it to anything I want, including the ester. So that's kind of the approach here. So in this case, we'll take that amide. And in this case, fastest way to get it into a carboxylic acid is just to add H3O plus with heat. And that'll get us our carboxylic acid. Now, technically in practice, you might actually have done this in the lab. You might've actually done this under basic conditions, added hydroxide and heat, formed the carboxylate, and then simply protonated it and got the carboxylic acid. So two steps, but uh, this looks good on paper. So, but sometimes you get a better yield if you do this under base catalyzed conditions, in certain cases like this one. So, all right, so we get that carboxylic acid though, either way. 
So, and then we can add either SOCL2 or PBR3, either way. But I'll make the acid chloride. You'll probably see that much more commonly. And now that I've got the acid chloride, I can turn that into any of the other carboxylic acid derivatives I want to. And so in this case, to make the ester, so we're gonna have to, again, replace it with the corresponding group here. And in this case, there's the group I want. And so if I wanted to use the corresponding neutral species, do this uncatalyzed, because I can, there's my reagent. If I want to do it base catalyzed, then I'll just use the conjugate base, the anion itself. Or if I want to do it acid catalyzed, which is totally unnecessary and not something you're likely to see because it's so unnecessary, but you just use the corresponding neutral alcohol along with acid. Any one of those on paper though looks fantastic. There would be your multi-step uh, conversion. Couldn't do it in one step because it was overall uphill from amide to ester, but we could do it in multiple steps. Cool. In principle, we've given two examples here, but that's ultimately how it works. If you're going downhill, typically you can do it one step. If you're going uphill, typically you're going to have to do it in multiple steps like we've done here. So, and the big thing is just realizing what you're trying to replace your leaving group with and realizing, do I need a catalyst, acid or base catalyzed or not? So, and then using the appropriate reagents. If you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? best thing you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for practice problems on nucleophilic acyl substitution, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. And brand new, I just started releasing the lessons for the OCHEM 2 final exam rapid review. I finished the OCHEM 1 final exam rapid review last semester. I've now started releasing lessons for the OCHEM 2 uh, final exam rapid review and hope to finish them by the end of the semester here. Those are also both included in my premium course on chadsprep.com.